So I, I didn't actually know I was going to give a talk at this conference, um, partly through being on vacation when Brendan sent me the email. Uh, and then looking at the title, I, I thought a lot about it and I wasn't quite sure what to say. And then I figured out, well, maybe it was really addressing me and asking me if I, how to choose and whether I can choose. And I, th well, I thought, well, then I can choose. Uh, so I'm choosing what to talk about. And um, I think that's the name of this session, really. I think we're all choosing what to talk about. So one of my favorite things uh, are, are cartoons. And um, I thought this was a nice one about many worlds. <coughs> I just got sent this last night, actually. Oh, I don't know. Other people like peanuts? <laughs> <coughs> okay, and then I thought also, well, uh, this is something else I, I like to do in my talk, is to advertise my book, uh, together with John, many people here, John Barrett and uh, David Wallace. Uh, Adrian was going to be here, so, uh, and many people here have chapters in this book, so I hope I speak for all of us. Um, that to urge you to buy. This is the $50 version uh, for and against many worlds. Okay, but what I'm going to talk about really is, is time and explaining time, and I, I just hope to bring together a number of themes in this conference, um, which is a useful thing that one can do when one improvises a talk. Okay, I want to start off with uh, my personal all-time hero, <coughs> Uh, and really, the cause of all of the problems, uh, or many of the problems to do with time, started off uh, with ballistics, <coughs> and Galileo asking himself how to figure out uh, how ballistics works. Uh, and, of course, what he did, one of the things that he did, was to develop uh, space-time diagrams. And they have an obvious function. Um, using them, it's a conceptual tool to understand uh, and quantify uh, motion, uh, also for developing the calculus, which uh, undoubtedly these were the sorts of techniques that Newton and Leibniz used, even if they didn't quite present their ideas in this way. Uh, and the, the real problem, or one of the problems to do with time, and the sort of problem that philosophers often worry about anyway, comes from taking this kind of diagrammatic representation seriously. Uh, maybe too seriously. So, so here's a philosopher, Max Black, uh, and this is what he had to say about diagrams like this, that this picture of a block universe composed of a timeless web of world lines and a four-dimensional space, however strongly suggested by the theory of relativity, is a piece of gratuitous metaphysics, since the concept of change, of something happening, is an inseparable component of the common sense concept of time and a necessary component of the scientist's view of reality, it is quite out of the question that theoretical physics should require us to hold the eleactic view that nothing happens in the objective world. Here, as so often in the philosophy of science, a useful limitation in the form of representation is mistaken for a deficiency of the universe. Well, I think read correctly, uh, one can agree with Max Black, but reading him rather superficially, it seems that there's really something wrong with this four-dimensional representation. Okay, I think there is a way of reading this uh, in which one can say, no, no, the four-dimensional representation is just fine. It's understanding it in terms of the view that nothing happens, the eleactic view and so on. Um, but what remains true is that philosophers and physicists do seem to have a difficult time of, pardon, <laughs> pardon the use of the word, a difficult time of, of uh, understanding this representation as being reality, representing reality as it is. Uh, and that extends even to someone like Hermann Weyl, um, who made a statement, uh, and Hugh Price already put this up, uh, I think yesterday, I'm putting it up again, <clears throat> and I think this is a fairly um, common view. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I suspect most people, when they're first taught the use 
of space-time diagrams, at least in relativity theory, if not in elementary mechanics, has some understanding like this of what they mean. Um, I'm actually rather struck by how close this is to John McTaggart's account of time and change. John McTaggart being a very uh, famous and influential philosopher who set up much of the agenda in philosophy of time in the last century. Um, so take any event, the death of Queen Anne, for example, and consider what changes can take place in its characteristics. That it is a death, that it is the death of Anne Stewart, that it has such causes, that it has such effects, every characteristic of this sort never changes. I'll jump the, the quotation. The event in question was the death of a queen. At the last moment of time, if time has a last moment, it will still be the death of a queen. And in every respect but one, it is equally devoid of change. But in one respect, it does change. It was once an event in the far future, then it became past, and will always remain past, though every moment it becomes further and further past. Okay, and because John McTaggart was at Cambridge, um, I'm thankful that Hugh isn't taking uh, McTaggart's chair. That would have been uh, a stretch, I think. Anyway, uh, it's called, often called Cambridge change, uh, or change with respect to A determinations. McTaggart introduced this terminology between A and B uh, determinations. A determinations are the, the, of being past, of being present, of being future, used as a monadic one-place predicate. B determinations, uh, relations of earlier than and later than and so forth. Okay, so a little surprising that Weil would really be endorsing Cambridge change as the, the understanding of uh, four-dimensional space-time. But I think that uh, it must be right. And I think this is what he's really got in mind. So here we have uh, the talk. That's where we are now. Um, now here's this little blue bubble is uh, maybe uh, an hour or two back. Maybe you were making your way here. Uh, and, you know, in the course of time, we crawl up our world lines the way that uh, uh, Vial said. And well, here we are. We're, we're in the talk at the moment. That's where we all are. We're, we're right there. Um, and then it's going to be gone. Okay, fine. But there is now a problem because you'll notice that in the talk, there's no blue dot anymore. So this is a representation of the talk, and it's supposed to be a representation of what was happening in the talk, and it seems that there was no consciousness present during my talk. Uh, this is... <laughs> So um, this is a little bit concerning. So let's just go back a moment. We'll put the consciousness back in there. And clearly what we've got to do is we need another consciousness coming on behind. Uh, so that when we, so this one, right. So the first consciousness went and left. And now we've got a consciousness in the talk and everything's okay again, except, oh, we've got the same problem. Uh, so we, we know how to fix that up. We've just got to do the same thing again. Uh, so here I'm doing it again, and um, but you know, guess what? The same problem occurs, recurs. So look, we just got to do that. And once we've done that, that's the consciousness. Once we've done that, well, we might as well have just left it as it was, with all the consciousness in all the brains right there, distributed through four-dimensional space-time. And of course, this talk is just one of many world lines. These are maybe world lines of communities of people and so forth, uh, and other kinds of objects. Okay. So, well, what to make of this? Um, uh, so, uh, here's Bertrand Russell. Uh, this is the... Uh, so, this is the chair that... Occupant of the chair that, that Hugh is uh, moving to. So, uh, this is right now. Change is the difference in respect of truth or falsehood between a proposition concerning an entity in a time t and a proposition concerning the same entity in another time t primed, provided that the two propositions differ only by the fact that t occurs in one where t primed occurs in the other. Uh, I, I am reminded of another cartoon that I looked for I would have liked to put up. It's a man horizontal, he's collapsed on the pavement, there are people standing around him, and there's a chiropodist standing there looking on, saying, well, 
If you ask me, I say untie his shoelaces and quickly, but then I'm a chiropodist. Uh, so this is Russell the logician, and this is his way of handling it. There are other ways of handling it. Here's Adolf Grunbraum, who was very inordinately interested in subjective experience and awareness and spent a lot of time studying uh, various forms of psychoanalysis. Uh, actually, quite rather critical of it, but anyway. So my characterization of present happening or occurring now is intended to deny that belonging to the present is a physical attribute of a physical event E, which is independent of any judgmental awareness of the occurrence of either E itself or of another event simultaneous with, with it. Uh, this formulation serves to articulate the mind dependence of nowness, not to claim erroneously that nowness has been eliminated by explicit definition in favour of tenselist temporal attributes or relations. So this is tending then to push uh, A-determinations and temporal attributes into uh, issues bound up with consciousness or awareness. All right, well, so now ask the flat-footed physicist, uh, and where, what has changed consist in and so forth, what is present, uh, what is past. And, uh, well, you measure things um, and you, uh, you will say that, uh, well, you'll measure things and actually increasingly we need to measure things to great accuracies and figure out things like coordinate systems and so forth so it gets more elaborate. Perhaps we need computers in order to do it. But the basic idea will be that change consists in the existence of successive distinct events uh, that seems fine. Passage consists in change. Okay, so these are very, I say, flat-footed, uh, uh, and uh, certainly have never satisfied philosophers. Uh, I'm not sure whether they have satisfied physicists, uh, but I certainly want more than that. Okay, we, we do want more. Um, <clears throat> now, the kind of... Uh, Concern I have, I think, was well articulated by Abner Shimoni. Uh, this is a comment he made uh, in a paper relating to Kant and McTaggart <coughs> on time. There is a very important principle linking epistemology and ontology, one that is pervasive in the literature of empiricism from, from Berkeley to the sense data theorists of the early 20th century and implicit in other philosophical writings that even though the distinction between appearance and reality is maintained, a minimal condition on ontology is to recognize a sufficient set of realities to account for appearances qua appearances. Okay, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and in connection with uh, the sort of thing that Hugh was saying yesterday um, and the sort of thing that Craig was saying as well, um, I don't think we really ought to be in the business of just throwing out um, what appear to be features of our experience, uh, as it were, proving or establishing that they are redundant through, for example, analysis of temporal reality in reverse directions or sideways on. I mean, I think those are fruitful things to do, but I think we also ought to be concerned with accounting for and explaining uh, the appearance of temporal change. Okay. <clears throat> Now, do we succeed in that with a four-dimensional representation? Um, the flat-footed physicist will quantify change uh, and perhaps has problems with flow, although, um, as uh, Steve Savard has said, when it comes to rate of flow, you can do somewhat better in special relativity and general relativity than you can uh, in Newtonian theory. But still it seems that something is, is absent from this four-dimensional representation. Uh, Michael Dummett articulated it roughly in the following way. Um, he puts it in terms of denying that there is time. Um, I think that's buying into the conclusion McTaggart was eventually driven to, namely that use of A determinations is just flat out contradictory, so we're stuck with B determinations, and since those don't characterize change adequately, therefore there is no time. Uh, Julian will uh, welcome, I think, this conclusion. Um, but here's Dummett's way of characterizing our situation. So we may ask what it is to deny the analog of A determinations for space. So these would be facts of kind A for space uh, to do with 
uh, what is here, what is there, uh, what is far, and so forth. So the Damant's claim is that the use of spatially token reflexive expressions, that's the technical term philosophers use for expressions like that, or did it in Damant's day, but this use is not essential for the description of objects as being in space. That is, I can describe an arrangement of objects in space, although I do not myself have any position in that space. Um, so I think uh, but perhaps part of the challenge here, whether you call it getting rid of time or understanding time, if we could have a grasp of four-dimensional space-time without being located in that space-time, uh, if we could have a grasp of it, a satisfactory grasp of it, then I think we would have a more acceptable understanding of temporal experience in those terms. Of course, Dummett is denying that we can do that. Okay. Now here's his example, and this actually refers now to my question that I put to, to Catherine McDermott uh, on the first day of the conference uh, about uh, neurological analogues or correlates of temporal perception um, uh, and how they work. In spatial perception, it seems they're easily uh, uh, we, we can learn what they are in brain structures and behavior, but temporal is more difficult. Anyway, so here's what Dummett says about, as an example of the space of my visual field, as an example of a space in which I am nowhere situated. In that space there is no here or there, no near or far. I am not in that space. Sounds rather odd, doesn't it, not to be in the space of one's own visual field. Uh, I gave the example to Catherine a couple of days ago of, of a spherical surface at which one is the center. I mean, it could be a wall, actually, if one's some distance from it. I can understand and grasp that wall as a two-dimensional surface without being located in that wall. Okay. Um, all right, and now here's back to Dummett. McTaggart is saying, on the other hand, a description of events as taking place in time is impossible uh, unless temporally token reflexive expressions into it. I've really got to be in there, in that time, and then in a position to use A-determinations. Um, okay, so, uh, and to drive home the point, Dummett says, suppose someone who can observe all events which take place in our universe during some period of time, he can give a complete narration of the sequence of events, but there would remain to be answered the question, and which of these events is happening now? Well, uh, what I want to suggest here, I've got a couple of suggestions in my talk, as, in this talk, as to what one's to say about this, but then I go on to really make some uh, a conjecture uh, and to ask some questions, um, specifically questions directed um, at brain scientists, people interested uh, in perception, uh, temporal uh, experience, and so forth. Um, to this challenge that Dummett has posed, uh, I just uh, a couple of remarks. One remark is if you go back to the two-dimensional wall, there's a rather interesting question if you actually ask, well, how far away is this space or where is this space? Where is this two-dimensional wall? And if it is purely spatial, is it therefore simultaneous, a system of simultaneous events, presumably? But then what is the criterion of simultaneity that is being used? And I think if you push that question, it becomes clear that we actually do not have a grasp of a two-dimensional surface uh, which is very remote, uh, or at least a, a three-dimensional surface less so, which is large. How could we have a, an intuitive grasp of a three-dimensional volume which is instantaneous? What is the criterion of simultaneity? Um, it's a, just as a remark on Einstein's 1905 paper, I don't know if you recall, he gave this lovely uh, account of a train arriving at a station, I mean, one of the most mundane paragraphs you could imagine in a, a physics paper and in one of the most important physics papers to boot. Um, and he says, of course, we ignore the, he says that we surmount the question of the relationship of the train arriving to the position of the hand and my watch, I'm not going to consider that. I'm not going to consider questions of simultaneity in relation of the train arriving to the position of the hand and my watch. He says we will surmount this by an abstraction. That's a footnote to the paper. And that's right, locally we just don't worry about issues of simultaneity. So that's what's going on locally. So it's the global grasp of a three-dimensional space that I say we do not have. 
Um, but now if that's right, and we don't have a, glass, a, glo a grasp of a global three-dimensional space occurring at an instant, I want to say something else, that we do have a grasp of four-dimensional space-time occurring locally. That's, that's anyway my suggestion. So here's the talk. I've got some more green ectoplasm. That's just to link up with the last talk. Uh, and if you look a little bit more closely, um, so we're getting right in there. Uh, and look, here we have the specious present is got in getting in there. All right, and we can think of this, I want you to think of this in two ways. One way is that it's maybe 100 meters across. Okay, so that would be a typical living space the sort of thing uh, going back to um, the sort of thing that we remember when we put ourselves into a situation in the past or the future place seems to be very important. So something like a 100 meter uh, place, or it could just be you know, the size of my brain. Okay, perhaps I'm talking about my species present. Uh, so, well, let's just call it 10 meters for now. It could be 50 meters, it could be 10 or 15 centimeters. Uh, but the time scale is the specious present. Um, uh, I think from, uh, from David I gather that really it's about 80 milliseconds, but I'm going to leave it a bit vague between 50 and 150 milliseconds. Uh, David uh, is, is going to talk about this right after me. Um, now, this seems to be uh, a, a fairly large space and a very short period of time. Okay. But, of course, that's really a matter of the units that we're using. So let's put it into natural units with c equal to 1. Um, and then you see, actually, this space isn't large spatially and small temporally at all. It's exactly the other way around. Um, it's, it's, long, it's long in time. A temporal duration now looks much larger than the spatial one. Um, now, this is just playing around with units, of course, and you might ask, look, what, what, what hangs on it? I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But what I want to suggest is that in the specious present, and this is a conjecture, uh, in the specious present, we actually have a spatiotemporal grasp and not a spatial grasp. Um, and the sort of thing I have in mind is that someone playing, I don't know, table tennis or something, things are happening pretty quickly. Um, in the time it takes to have a grasp of, the, of what's going on, any sort of a grasp at all of what's going on, one, one actually has an understanding, a grasp, direct perceptual grasp, of the movement of the ball. And this isn't Cambridge change. That's, that's the point. So this is not Cambridge change. So the suggestion is there are two quite distinct grasps that we have of time. One is Cambridge change, and that, I was another conjecture, but I think a very plausible one, is inherently bound up with memory, uh, with future-directed thought, past-directed thought, and perhaps interjecting oneself into past and future, as we were hearing about a couple of days ago. Uh, but the other kind of grasp of time that we have is this local grasp of time, which is just as good as our grasp of space. That's, that's the suggestion, just as good as our grasp of space. Um, Okay, now that, and that may be just wrong, all right? I mean, I, I'm, this is, I think, an open question. I, I'm sure one that a number of uh, neurologists involved with temporal perception have worked on, and I don't know whether I'm right in this conjecture or not. Now, another sort of question that one can ask, um, and this is all in the ballpark of explanation, is, well, why is this thing so long? in time and, sh and uh, narrow in space, or one way of putting it, why is a thought so long and thin? Uh, and that question um, is not entirely original to me. Um, Howard Stein posed something similar in a paper, it must be 20 years ago, why is it that in the geometry of space-time we are so long and thin? Because the same applies to the body, of course, uh, over the specious present. And he himself was adapting this question from one of Schrodinger, namely, why are atoms so small? Um, and Schrodinger himself parlayed that into the question, why should an organ like our brain of necessity consist of an enormous number of atoms in order that its physically changing state should be in close and intimate correspondence with a highly developed thought? 
Okay, um, so what I'm going to go on to do is give some, uh, a bit of a summary of what Howard Stein had to say about this, because it seems to me very suggestive. Uh, now, here's the point about using natural units. Uh, it doesn't, it's not really relevant. What does matter is that the sort of signaling that can go on during the specious present, the specious present being a cognitive event, it's highly constructed, there's an enormous amount of of software and hardware going on in there. Uh, and these are signaling going back and forth, so this would be going back and forth over the neural complex that is a human brain, uh, many, many millions, perhaps billions of such events comprising the experience of the specious present. And again, I asked neurologists to perhaps uh, help here with just what sort of signaling has to go on to construct momentary experience. Um, it doesn't really matter whether you squish up the rectangle or stretch it out or whatever. The point is that you've got many hundreds of thousands, millions perhaps, of events like this that are involved in the specious present. Now here's what Stein has to say about this. Uh, he takes this as explanatory of something. I think it could be understood as explanatory of why experience, awareness, is of the order of 50, 100 milliseconds. Okay. Now, I don't know if that reasoning really goes through. Does this reasoning mean that you couldn't have uh, uh, awareness, uh, cognitive experience, or some sort of gestalt experience that lasts for an hour? I, I don't really see why. It doesn't seem to me to set an upper bound, but it may well set a lower bound. Anyway, this is what Stein says about it. For stable configurations of particle to be established, and for processes with stable patterns to occur, or for orderly readjustments of such patterns to occur, it will in general be necessary for very many interactions back and forth to take place throughout the system in question. Roughly speaking, many signals must pass in both directions to establish a degree of regular coordination. And from this it immediately follows that the graining of time with respect to which a percipient organism can experience conscious interaction with its environment must be such that the moments of time, the specious presence, are long enough to allow such signals and therefore light signals to travel very many times the maximum spatial dimensions of the organism. And now he adds, together with its relevant environment. And I think that's a, a very interesting addition. Of course, that, you know, if we're going to take that seriously, what we should be looking at here, this thing isn't 15 centimeters. We're not talking about the brain here. We're talking about maybe 50 meter environment, that sort of thing. It doesn't change, you know, if you like, the, 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 the long and thin business. It's still, you know, one to a million, one to a hundred thousand. Uh, but then the issue becomes that one establishes something like a public space uh, in which we are all participants. Um, and one is thereby accounting for, and I don't know how good this explanation really works. As I say, I think this is suggestive. Uh, but one is accounting for really the construction of the present as a public space in which we are all engaged. Okay, uh, so this was this. So I come back to the business of the more, what more is needed. Um, the kind of account that I've just really just sketched a very little bit of it would fill out what is involved in temporality in this four dimensional representation uh, other than mere flat footed comments like this, change consistently existence of successive distinct events and so forth. Um, it's giving partly an account of temporal experience. This takes us to neuroscience, obviously, and uh, behavioral sciences. Uh, but also, it, uh, in terms of the apparently irreversible characteristics of macroscopic experience, uh, so it needs all of the sort of thing that David was talking about uh, an hour ago, and that both Davids, David Alban and David Wallace, were talking about in terms of entropy change, um, and it, I suggest further, because where, one doesn't stop, issues of causation and intervention, again the sort of thing David Albert was talking about, where one gives an analysis of uh, our causal competences, specifically with regard to the future and contrast with regard to the past, uh, in ways that I think uh, that David was getting at, uh, highly informative, very suggestive, extremely interesting. Now, you put together a package this big, and there's going to be more, and I think you start to get at 
a rather comprehensive understanding of, um, of time, okay, at least at this macroscopic, possibly emergent level. And I'll just finish with one last cartoon. I do like cartoons. It's one of my favorites. <coughs> and I'm not quite sure what it illustrates, but I just like it so much. But I think it illustrates something that's completely nutty that you might have thought was involved in demonstrating what time is, that somehow you would produce equations and there the, you know, the time would somehow come to live, to, alive to you and look just like what we always thought it was. And that, I think, is, is a really mistaken understanding of what, um, what we're about and what natural sciences are about. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>